This is the True Hustle Podcast with your host, JR. This is the True Hustle Podcast with your host, JR. Okay. CEO, founder of Skyline. You've been on the the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Yes. You've been on uh, Grant Cardone's podcast. Mm-hmm. You've been on uh, Ed Milet's podcast. Yeah. You've also been on Jordan on Jordan Belfort's uh, yeah. podcast. Yeah, yeah. And you are from Huntington Park. <laughs> That's amazing. Those are my I stomping lo- grounds. I know. So- I, I still. I love Huntington Park. It's still like one of my. When I think of my time in Huntington Park, like I had so much fun. It was. It was awesome. Did you? I, go I'd, sh- I'd go there more if they actually had like a freeway that was close to it. But oh. to get to Huntington Park, it's like you got to get off on the 710. Or the 110. Or the 110. Side. It just takes forever to get to Huntington Park, man. But I have such great memories. Which ones are your fondest memories of the actual city? Sh- playing street football. Uh, you know, we lived on Walnut Street, uh, which is off state, right behind the rallies. Oh, wow. Uh, state in Florence. No, yes. You got Walnut Street. It's like so, walking distance to Salt yeah, Lake Park. I, I think what I love, yeah, I used to go yeah. to Salt Lake Park all the time. In <laughs> fact, you know, I, I was sea track. So during vacation, my mom was always, you know, cleaning offices and stuff. So I'd be by myself. And um, the, the great thing about Walnut Street is there's about eight of us the same age that grew up there. Okay. So we'd always play street football. We'd go to Salt Lake Park. We'd always be doing things together. It's just like we were always... Uh, very competitive and um, that's one of the great things my mom was able to do for me she always put me in sports and okay. I'd have to go sign myself up but my mom would be <laughs> like all right mom now I need you to come pay and okay. uh, you know I was they, my friends used to call me a park legend because I never actually played high school sports but growing up I played all the park sports but a big reason for okay. that was because I had to start working at 15 years old so I never got to play uh, in fact one of my regrets is I never got to play any high school football or, okay. or basketball. I, I played one year of freshman basketball. And did you play for Huntington Park High School? Or? Yeah, for Huntington Park High School. Also, yeah. you're a Spartan. I'm a Spartan. I went to Gage. <laughs> this guy is a Spartan too. There we go. We got <laughs> HP in the house. Yes, man. That, when I see, okay, so I've had Jerry Garcia here and he's from Huntington Park too. Mm. And he has a HBO special and he, he's like really proud of being from Huntington Park. So when yeah. I see successful people coming from our city, yeah, it makes me really proud. I'm over there like I didn't know until I seen your uh, your max out on uh, what's it called podcast with uh, Ed. Yeah, with Ed, and yeah. I'm like, did you hear that? I told Sabrina, he's from HP. Oh my god, oh, <laughs> that's amazing. Class of 1995. Oh wow, what class were you? <sighs> 2002. 2002. Yeah. So I got you by seven. Yeah, years. Right. <laughs> so, I barely graduated. I graduated with a 1.8 GPA. Oh, you beat me. <laughs> I was 1.7. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I wasn't I wasn't a great scholar. I neither was I. I in fact I took basic math my high school year. Wow. Cuz I wanted to kind of like, ah, basic what, what am I going to do? I, I never took algebra, geometry, any of that. Just so, basic math. So you just coasted through high school. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty coasted much. and and I'd sit next to the smart kids when it was test day and, you know, it's kind of there that I knew I was pretty good at building relationships, you know, because wow. I always treated people with respect, you know. That's important. Yeah. Absolutely. So how do you coast through high school and then be in a position that you're in now? So I think, you know, so at 15 years old, I was lucky enough to get a job working at a call center. And at the time, it wasn't the most ideal job for me because I was very shy and I was very timid. Uh, but I quickly got the courage to do this job I did not want to do just in my desperation to help my family out because at this point I was tired of you know seeing my mom not be able to pay for the rent at the end of the month us not having enough food at the end of the month because we run out of food stamps I was tired of my siblings uh, mother and I living in this tiny little bedroom without any windows back for Mother's Day my mom reminded me how we used to sleep in the in the she's like do you remember when we used to sleep in the bed and we were you know she'd be Upside, like upside down, right? Am I saying that right? <laughs> so her feet would be in her face, and, and my then feet you would be in. Yeah, the... my feet would be in her face, and her feet would be in my face, and then our other kids would. I mean, our uh, my siblings would be on the floor, um, and uh, and in their little little mattress bed, right? Okay. And I was like, yeah, and then I was just tired of like roaches waking me up in the middle of the night. So the desperate, you know, the avoidance of pain caused me to take action towards 
really something that demanded more than I thought I was worth because I didn't think I could do that job. Now, even though I was very shy and I was very timid, the one thing that I did have going for me is, man, I was a big, big dreamer. You know, I told you my mom would, when she'd go work and, mm-hmm. and, and I'd be left alone at the house. In addition to going to Salt Lake Park and just visualize me hitting game winning shots all day, all day long, I would, I would, I, I, I would think about making a hundred grand a year and I became obsessed with making that by the age of 21. I just said, and I would say, I mean, it's the story of my life. I don't know how I'm gonna yeah. do it, but I'm gonna figure it out. And I, I remember saying that to myself at 12 years old. I'm gonna make 21, I'm gonna make a hundred grand a year by the time I'm 21. So when I got the job working at a call center, I started focusing on the only things that I can control, which was I could outwork everyone and I could prepare Absolutely. better than everyone else. And all these things on the left side that made it impossible for me to become the manager at eight, by the age of 18, I just left that stuff up to, you know, God, I've always gotten my confidence from mm-hmm. God and knowing that God's with me. And I just thought like, yeah, I know people are twice my age. I know people communicate better than me. I know people are going to college. I know people have seniority over me, but I can't think of that. I'm just gonna work my butt off. And by somehow I know by 18 years old, I'd become the manager. And again, I've, I've gotten to where I've gotten just wow. common sense and drive. If I wanted to make a hundred grand by the time I was 21, mm-hmm. then that meant I had to be at least become the manager by 18. Cause at 18, I'd be making 60 grand is what I thought. I just worked my butt off. And then sure enough, at 18 years old, I became the youngest manager in company history, but not because I was the most talented or because I was the most deserving, but the six people in front of me that were way more talented, way more deserving, all got fired for doing some things they shouldn't have been doing at a party, a company party, and I got my <laughs> shot at 18 years old. So that was, a, wow. that was a big moment in my life because it was the first time that I truly began to believe in myself. And you know, other than hope, which is I think the number one thing you need for success, because hope is like the desire to wanna do something great mm-hmm. with your life. I always wanna do something great with my life. I think you need faith and Absolutely. the, the positive mental attitude that you need. I think 90% of winning is, is positive mental attitude. Again, for me, I'm a follower of Christ. So just knowing that God was with me gave me a little more confidence. And then believing in yourself because you can only receive what your mind can accept. If your mind can't accept something, it's never going to get it. So the idea is to, to, to build that identity. And, and as I look back, what I did is I put myself in the situation that demanded more than I thought I was worth. And then when I succeeded at it, Mm -hmm. I began to believe that, wait a minute, maybe I am worth a hundred grand a year because I don't see no other 18 year old making a thousand bucks a week, managing people twice my age, especially from Huntington Park, right? So uh, that was a big moment. And I I started to really believe it. And I always say to people that you don't believe something in your heart until you actually experience it. The only way you experience it is if you actually give yourself a shot and step into the uncertainty of something that demands more than you think you're worth. But if you really think about it, if something demands more than you think you're worth, you're probably not gonna wanna do it. It's probably gonna scare you. And that's why a lot of people don't step into the arena of uncertainty because they let that fear paralyze them. Mm -hmm. So they never give themselves a shot. And as I look back at my life, I just have always given myself a shot and when I've given myself that shot, I've figured out how to do it, even though I might have fallen a bunch of times, but eventually I figure it out. And now that's how my identity picks up and starts to believe like, well, maybe, maybe, maybe you do deserve more, right? But if you don't step into that arena of uncertainty, you'll never take the shot, which means you'll never believe it. Wow. I'm trying to process what you just said. And you were thinking, you had this mindset at 16. Yeah. That's just mind blowing. Well, like, I think a lot of it was, I, I promised my dad at 10 years old that when he got out of jail, he'd never have to work a day in his life. And you know, my dad, before he left to jail, before they took him into jail, he asked me, son, I need you to, he didn't ask me, he told me, you need to become the man of the house. Like I'm looking for you to take care of the family. Mm-hmm. And at that time it was just my siblings and my mom and I. And I took that very serious. And then it was, a, you know, the, he left us some money mm-hmm. and we were okay for like two years, but then we lost everything. And that's how we ended up in Huntington Park. Cause we had, 
nowhere to go but Huntington Park. And first we found this three-bedroom apartment. Life was kind of good. And then we sort of ran out of money. And then we had to rent out the two bedrooms in the three-bedroom apartment, which is how we ended up in that tiny little bedroom without any windows. But seeing my mom struggle during those times and just walking in on her and seeing her cry and all the chaos that was happening in our lives, I promised her that one day I was going to buy her house in Downey. So I knew, again, common sense. I thought to myself, you know, is 60 grand going to make that happen? And the answer was no. Mm -hmm. Like the only way that those dreams would happen was if I found an opportunity that paid me at least 100 grand or more. See, I think to you don't have to be that smart to be to make six figures and seven figures, like eight figures a year. I, I'm an example of that. You don't have to be that smart. You do have to have common sense and you have to have drive. So if you want to make six figures, seven figures a year, eight figures a year, you just have to find an opportunity that allows you to make that kind of money. And the second thing you'd need, which is the hardest, is you need to find someone who's done it before who has a vested interest in your success that's going to help you do it. And if you can find that person, mm -hmm. which is not easy to do, but if you can find that person, the only reason you wouldn't make that kind of money is if you don't work hard, you know, because that's the one thing you can't teach, right? So for me, I, I needed, you know, and, and in addition to that, to those promises I had made my parents, I was, almost, I was also a huge dreamer. You know, I, I would ditch school my senior year quite a bit. It's probably why I ended up with that 1.8 GPA. But I'd go to Rodeo <laughs> Drive and I'd go to Beverly Hills. And I remember just saying to myself, man, people dress different here. People look different here. Like the homes are amazing here. And I'd go eat at some of these restaurants. I was mm -hmm. like, holy crap. Like, and you were old? 18, 17 years old. You know, uh -huh. I'd take my beat up Nissan Sentra to Beverly Hills and go window shopping. And uh, funny story, actually, I don't think I've said this in a podcast before. How I, ended up, how I ended up going to Rodeo Drive was because... I, uh, you know, Ricky Martin was a big hit back then. You know, all the girls okay. were loving Ricky Martin and I forgot the album, the Vuelve or something like that. It was um, La Vida Loca? No, it was before that. It, <laughs> okay. was, it, was, it was the Spanish album that came out in 95, La Bomba, if you okay. remember that okay. song, La Bomba. And I remember, you know, all the girls were going crazy for him. I think I picked up a magazine and I was like, he shops at Emporio Armani. So I looked mm -hmm. up Emporio Armani. I'm like, oh, that's out in Beverly Hills. Let me go check it out. So I literally probably had like a pretty woman moment. I show up with my size 42 jeans, you know. I don't know if you remember those days, but everyone would use you those 501. the solos or the 501s? Yeah, the 501 really jeans, really baggy oh, 42 man. with the belt. Okay. And uh, yeah, you are from Huntington Park. Yes. Muscle We're shirt. Right here. <laughs> yeah, I had the white beater on. And I show up to Emporio Armani. And luckily for me, the, the, the salesperson was Mexican. And he like took me under his wing and we became best friends, not best friends, but we became really good friends. Okay. And he started giving me 50% discount. So, so you, man, tra you started tra dressing like You me. traded in those baggy pants for some oh. Armani. And then, uh, man, I guess the clothes made a difference because all of a sudden women started paying attention to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, that's how that's how I ended up in in, in Rodeo Drive. Um, and then, but once I was there, I looked at the cars, and I call that touching the dream, right? I started looking at those houses, and I was like, man, again, common theme. I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to figure it out. This is where I'm going to end up. I'm going to live on the edge of the hill, and I'm going to overlook the entire city. And again, I started. So I started finding what happens when you touch the dream. First of all, it took me out of the bubble of Huntington Park in Southgate. Okay. It made me realize, like, wait a minute, there's a whole different world outside of Huntington Park in Southgate. And it made me realize, like, I still got a lot of growing to do, right? And what that did is now it got my subconscious mind to go out and find opportunities to make those dreams happen, Okay. right? So uh, that was the importance of me going out there and, and, and touching the dream. And that's, that's why in my business today, I go out of my way so the guys can touch the dream and see it for themselves because you can't change something you're not aware of, right? Like if you've never sat in the owner's box at SoFi, like why would you work your butt off to get there, right? So I took like, perfect example, I took one of my guys, a big, I'm a big Rams fan. We do, we do amazing incentives at our company. And uh, 
took him to the owners club uh, at SoFi. Mm-hmm. It was one of the, just these moments that I'll always remember, which is he's sitting next to me and he looks up. He's like, Edwin, you know, that's where I always sit, right? He's like way in the nose. He's like, man, I'll ne- I'm never sitting nosebleed again. This is where I belong. Because now yeah. the perspective is different, right? Yeah. Once you sit down there, you never want to go back up yeah, there. Exactly. But if you if you never get to sit in those seats, like you'll never know. So why would you want to work your butt off? If you never go to a nice restaurant, if you've never been to Mastro's, like why, why would you want to work your ass off to, to go to Mastro's, right? Again, you could only change something that you're aware of, but if you don't become aware of it, you, you won't want to do it, right? Like you won't know the difference. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for me, you know, there's, there's no point of creating a beautiful life for yourself if you're not willing to share it with people. So I just, I love sharing point. it with people because it just reminds me of me when I was younger. And, and, you know, luckily for me, I was blessed to just go figure it out on my own and go touch it and, and see it and be like, whoa, this is, this is what, this is what, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to end up. So did your dreams, you said you were touching the dream. Mm-hmm. What plan of action did you have? To tackle those dreams. Yeah. Because a lot of people dream, mm-hmm. but then they go sit down. Yeah. So what, like, yeah, so you have to have, like, like a blueprint. A plan, yeah, so, again, back to the common sense stuff, right? You need, you need yeah. an opportunity that allows you to make that kind of money, and then you need someone who's got a vested in your success that's going to help you do it, right? So when I became the youngest manager in company history, I became the right hand of the VP of sales. Okay. And he was making about 250 grand a year. So three years later, he comes into my office. He says, hey, Edwin, I'm going to start this home security company. He says, I can't guarantee you the 70000 that you make here. But if you make this work, you could possibly double, triple, quadruple what you make here. And the first thing I thought was, well, he's leaving it. He makes two hundred fifty grand. He's leaving the job because he thinks he can make millions in another industry. I'm like, Mm. well, that sounds pretty reasonable. Second thing I thought was, if he's willing to mentor me how to start a company from the ground up, I'm like, this is the, the mentorship I've been looking for yes. my entire life. And then the third thing was I knew I had these big dreams. And I, again, I used common sense. I said, is $70,000 a year going to make those dreams happen? No. Then I looked at the worst case scenario. Cause one of the ways that you eliminate fear is you look at the worst case scenario. And if you're okay with the outcome, then you'll be fine. And I looked at the worst case scenario. I said, you know, now we were sort of moving up, Mm-hmm. Hopefully my people from HP don't kill me for saying this, but <laughs> I went from we're H- going to give you a pass. <laughs> I, 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 I went from I went from HP to Southgate, so you know Southgate I was did a, the same. So don't worry, <laughs> okay, you did the same, All right? So we went to Southgate. Uh, I, I guess you go from HP to Southgate to Downey. So Downey. Right? Downey <laughs> yeah. is the the. Uh, the final destination. Oh, that was my mom's <laughs> dream. She's like, mijo, quiero mi casa en Downey. Yeah. Mom, this is not in Downey. Well, again, progress, right? So we went from HP to Southgate. And at the time, I was making, again, 70 grand a year. And I thought of the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is I fail miserably. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, if we fail miserably, maybe I end up in Watts, in the projects. Not that much different than that little tiny apartment that we lived in Mm -hmm. but if we make this work i can make my dreams happen and that that's really what it came down to and 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 then i just i took the plunge you know i think the purpose of a goal is not necessarily to accomplish it Mm -hmm. but become but it's to become the person that attempts it and again many people get stuck being average because they don't even give themselves a shot and there was no way in hell that I was going to be 70 years old one day, look back at my life and say, man, I took it, I, I, I took it, I, I wasn't willing to take any risk. Like at some point, you got to take a shot, you know? And, you know, I think if you're always pay, playing it safe, at least to me, like you squeeze God out of the formula. If you only go where you know, mm-hmm. and you only do the things that you know you're going to succeed at, then there is no need for God. But like for me, that's why I've always embraced uncertainty because it's in uncertainty where my need for God gets heightened. It's where I know I'm going to grow and it's where he's always met me. Yeah, I think for people it's easier. Mm -hmm. Safer. Safer. People want to be in the safe zone. 
Yeah. Like they don't want to take that that leap. Because yeah, they don't, they they don't know. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they'd rather feel safe yeah. than take risks. And, and, but that's why, you know, I think, again, if, I think if people are scared, just look at the worst case scenario. Like, again, I, I was making 70 grand a year. I was still only a mile away from Watts. Like, I, it wasn't like at some point I had to give myself a real shot. And, and the, the other thing that I did, again, common sense, is I thought to myself, is $70,000 a year going to be available again? The answer was yes. But is the opportunity to be mentored by the only successful guy I knew at the time with an opportunity to make a million dollars, how often is that opportunity going to come, right? So that's why, like, jobs that pay you 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, those jobs are always going to be available, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, right. So why not give yourself a shot? If, like, worst, worst comes to worst, you'll find that $20 an hour job again. But an opportunity where you can make six figures, seven figures, eight figures, you know, those opportunities don't come around that, that often. So when they do, you better take a shot at it. I agree. I always bet it. I always bet on myself. Yeah. And I always, I look at, it's funny that you brought that up because I look at worst case scenario for everything that I do. Mm-hmm. Like I do real estate, so I invest in real estate. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, what's my worst case scenario on this one? Yeah. Okay, if this happens, nah, I'm okay. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. The free goes start, away. Yeah, it's, it's just, yeah. it is what it is. Yeah. Wow. Calculated risk. Exactly. What are some of the hardships that you went through, like through during that process? Because you did leave yeah. your seventy thousand dollar back then. That was yeah. a lot of money. Yeah, it was a lot of money. That's back in nineteen ninety nine. So of course you bet it all on yourself. <clears throat> so what were some of the hardships that that uh, uh, that were a bit difficult, but you were able to overcome? Yeah, great question. Immediately, I I had done so well at the call center that I was at that I came in a little arrogant to the home security mm-hmm. space. And what I mean by arrogant was that I didn't take the time to learn my material. Like I, I looked at the script that okay. they gave me. I looked at the rebuttals. I said, oh, this is easy. So I didn't even practice it. I just looked at it once and I thought I could just go out there and wing it. And we went door to door. So ignorance gives you fear. And yes, what I you, agree what you transfer to the (laughs) client, you know, sales is just a transfer of belief, right? You know, people don't have to necessarily believe what you're saying. They have to believe you believe what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was this doubt when I'd go knock on doors because I didn't know my stuff. Every door, I sounded different. Every door I was saying something different and I was trying to wing it. So everybody would tell me, no, no, no. I went 10 days without able to, without being able to sell. And then The only reason I stayed doing what I was doing was because my brother-in-law at the time was doing two sales a day. So he's Mm -hmm. making like a grand a day. And I was like, wait a minute. If he can do it, I should be able to do it because I'm just as good as him, right? And I said, what am I doing different that he's not? And what I was doing different was that when I first started, I didn't resign from the call center that I worked for. I was able to convince the seniors to change my schedule around. So instead of working from three to 11, I started working from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then I'd get out of work and then at four to 10, I'd go knock on doors. Well, the problem with that was I didn't have any urgency because I was still making my 1500 bucks a week. Mm -hmm. So at that point I had to burn the ship. And I walked into the call center that I'd been at for six years and I resigned. And now my urgency level freaking went through the roof yeah. right because so now I it's like hey that fifteen hundred dollars ain't there anymore <laughs> right now you gotta get to it yeah so all of a sudden what i couldn't memorize in 10 days i memorized it over the weekend I memorized the rebuttals over the weekend i knew how to do the paperwork i mean i studied my butt off i easily put i don't know 20 hours in just straight training saying the pitch in the restroom saying the mm-hmm. pitch while i was driving <laughs> you know just <laughs> saying it saying it saying it saying it well, Monday I came back with so much confidence. Now knowledge when applied gives you confidence. So that day I, I got five sales in one day. I couldn't sleep that night because then I really started dreaming. I was like, man, imagine, I just made 1,500, 2,500 bucks today. Imagine 29 more days I could make 2,500 bucks imagine every the day. the possibilities. Oh, man, I started dreaming and then from then on I was just like, the next day I kept looking at my watch. Is it, is it, is it 3 p.m. yet, is it 3 p.m.? 
and boom. And then I ended up with 12 sales that day, uh, 12 installs that week. So I made about <coughs> five grand. Mm -hmm. And funny story, which I don't think I've shared this either. So I make 12 grand. I mean, I make five, six grand that week. And again, my ignorance at the time, I'm like, I'm gonna go to an open house. And my friends, you know, they want to hang out on weekends, right? Okay. They call me, hey, Edwin, let's go hang out, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, well, no, nah, man, I'm going to go look at an open house. You know, they start laughing at me. Was it in Downey? It was in Downey. Oh. Well, I promised my mom I was going to get to that house, right? I knew it. And um, Mexican Beverly Hills. Yep, Mexican Beverly Hills. So I was in Downey, and my friends are like, they start laughing. They're like, dude, what are you going to do at, at an open house? Like, yeah, you made five grand this week, but what makes you think... <laughs> you could make that kind of money for the next 30 years. You don't even have a college degree. Like, why don't you wait a couple months and see how this is gonna work out? And I said to them, because they said, well, the business goes away. I said, it doesn't matter if the business goes away, no matter where I go, I'm gonna be successful because I'm worth at least 100 grand a year. Like, I know wherever I go, yes. I'm worth 100 grand a year. So I went to that open house, again, not knowing anything. All I knew was that if you don't go to college, you ain't buying a house. Like all I knew was that you're going to rent for the rest of your life. So I go to this open house and it was the coolest thing. The, the, the loan officers there. And he's like, Oh yeah, you just have to come with 3% down. I'm like 3%. I do my math, basic math. <laughs> it's 12 grand. <laughs> I do that in a month, yeah, like, and like two I'll, weeks. And, and then he's like, um, and I said, well, what would the payment be? He's like 1400. Like fourteen hundred, I do that. In what a year day. was this? Nineteen ninety nine. Okay, yeah. I was like, man, fourteen hundred. The house was one sixty five, I believe, is what I bought it for. Wow. Um, and uh, and then I just did basic math. I was like, all right, my bills are four grand a month, so I need to make mm -hmm. a grand a month. I need to make a grand, grand a week. Okay. I need another grand a week to pay the IRS and have some savings, and then I need to pay another grand a week for this twelve week savings. And then I just gave myself a deadline. Again, not knowing any better at the time, I'm just like, I'm gonna do mm -hmm. it in 90 days. I picked up my mom in Southgate, drove her to Downey. I said, mom, this house will be yours in 90 days. Maybe it's not this one, but it'll look just like this. But I promise you, 90 days, this house is yours. And that, again, created this urgency in me to now make it, to make it happen. So I often say, like, I, I sort of got tricked into success because now that I knew what I was working for, mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't like while everybody quit at eight o'clock, I kept going and I wasn't going to leave until I got a sale. So I can't tell you how many times I got a deal at nine 30, 10 o'clock at night, 10 30 at night. And what that did is every time I got it, my belief level started to increase. Right. And everything is a transfer of belief. Right. Well, I did it so many times that I never look desperate anymore. See, I think people don't buy from you because you look desperate, right? Yes, and I agree with that 100%. It's the only reason they don't buy from you because you look desperate, right? But I had gotten so many last minute deals that when it was like 8.30 at night and I didn't have a sale yet, I just knew it was coming. Like, I just knew it was a matter of time. Because it was just like a numbers game, like, okay. Yeah, if and, and I just knew, because I had done it so many times that at the end of the night, I always get one. So I remember I would even speak things into existence at like, it'd be like nine o'clock. I'm like, well, that house has to be it. Cause I never leave without a sale and mm. I would be training a guy. So you were manifesting it. Yeah. And I, and, but it's, it's because I had experienced okay. it. Right. Cause uh -huh. you could say it all you want until you experience it. You won't believe it. Like you only believe something in your heart if you experience it. So, and the only reason I experienced it, it wasn't that I was that good at sales. I just outworked everybody. It's just, I took enough shots. Like it's like Kobe Bryant, right? He, freaking shot the ball like crazy eventually he starts making them so the confidence goes up if you think of that you know in his rookie year he airballs four in a row in the playoffs to get kicked out of the playoffs <clears throat> most people would have never shot the ball again because they would have been so scared of all the you know all the mm -hmm. the complaints that came out of that right what does he do the next year he shoots it even more well eventually if you just keep shooting you're going to make them and then your belief level happens. And that's what I did. And I, I owe that to just having a, a plan and a goal, my why, that makes you cry, which is to buy my mom her house. Because I truly believe if I didn't have, if I wouldn't have done that, then what I would have done was work enough to pay my bills. So I had made five grand in a week, mm -hmm. right? Or yeah, four, five, six grand in that week. 
if I didn't know what I was working for, I would have already paid my bills for the month. So the next week, my urgency wouldn't have been the same. I would have gone back down to like 1500 bucks. Make sense? But because I knew what I was working for and it was like my life depended on mm -hmm. it, I'm gonna do this shit in 90 days. There's no way I'm gonna let my mom down. So the urgency kept going up, right? And I had this, so I call it putting yourself in a pressure situation that increases your urgency level, increases your necessity level. A necessity level is a sudden willingness that untaps this tremendous amount of ability that you didn't even know you possessed, right? But in order to do that, you have to put yourself in those kind of situations, right? Mm -hmm. Now, some people can't handle pressure, right? That's because they have a history of not keeping the promises they make to themselves. So if you're not a person that keeps promises to themselves, you can't just put yourself in a crazy pressure situation. But what you can do is start getting some wins under your belt and continue to get some wins under your belt by keeping promises you make to yourself. All of a sudden, you can take on things that, you know, are pre that, that, that put pressure, but you can handle it because you've been through it, right? See, the difference between average people and elite people is elite people can take pressure, elite people can take stress, elite people can take resistance. Why? Because when the pressure comes and when the stress comes, instead of running away from it, they stand in it and they continue to push forward, focusing on the things that they can control. And when they do that, mm -hmm. And they, they, they have faith that all this other stuff that's making it seem crazy, again, whatever you believe in, for me, mm -hmm. God will start putting the right people in front, of me to, in front of me to make the impossible possible. And what happens is when you stand in the pain, going through that resistance, pushing forward, you build the muscles that you need to sustain success for a long time. Because life and pain are inseparable. You're always going to have pain in your life. And if you don't know how to deal with pain because you always run away from it, you'll never build the muscles that you'll need, right? And that's why I think the three biggest skill sets that you could ever have are grit, mm -hmm. fortitude, and resiliency. And they're skill sets because you can learn them. But you're not born with them. You get to cultivate them. And you cultivate them by going through tough times. And the reason I think they're the three top ones is no matter where you go, you'll be successful. Like no industry can take that away from you. If the real estate industry goes away, which it won't, or if the alarm industry goes away or the solar industry goes away, it doesn't matter where I go, I'm gonna be successful because I'm used to dealing with pain, right? Like people think it gets easier when you, the higher you get in life mm -hmm. and the more successful you get, it actually gets a lot harder. You just become better and it looks easier, right? Because you've gotten better. So, you know, that, that's, that's the beauty about putting yourself in these pressure situations and, and succeeding at them is you get, you get used to it. And then when things come, they're not a big deal anymore. They're just like, yeah. Do you think dealing with pressure is a skill that you could develop mm -hmm. or either you just have it or you don't? You could totally develop it. You develop it 100%. And, and again, you develop it by standing in the pain and not running away from it. I think the reason why people don't have it and can't handle pressure, they never give themselves a shot. Because as soon as the pain comes, they go off to do something else. Hmm. Right? They, they take the easy route. Oh, pain's coming. Oh, let me go look for the other easy thing. Well, if you're constantly looking for the easy road, like everything easy is downhill. Everything worthwhile is uphill. So... The adversity that you've dealt with, mm -hmm. has it has it prepared you for, yeah, you know this type of resiliency? Like, because you went through a lot growing up. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think as I think back about you know when our home would get raided by law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So two weeks after coming to the U.S., our home gets raided by law enforcement. Both my parents end up in jail. My sister and I end up at a foster home. We were there for eight months because then my parents got. Um, acquitted of all charges. And then we're thinking this nightmare is over. However, the nightmare was just beginning because every year our home would get raided by law enforcement. And it went on for four years until they finally caught my dad and they, mm -hmm. they, they put him away for a while. But as I think back, I don't know if you've ever been part of a raid, but they come no, in, guns drawn, 
kick the door. I see it on down. TV though. It's is just, it something similar to just it? Just like that. <laughs> kick the door. In fact, oh, man. I remember two weeks after coming to the U.S., I hear a knock. I'm the one that went to go answer it. It was probably the worst, well, it was the worst day of my life because I spent all day crying at oh, school because it was my first day at school and I was the only Latin kid there. Everyone else had blonde, blue eyes. We lived in Glendora. And literally, I was the only Hispanic kid there. And I was crying all day because no one would speak to me in Spanish, and I didn't know anything, right? <laughs> Five o'clock, I hear oh, a door man. knock. I go, up, and as I'm about to answer, there's a freaking boom. Thump on the, kick the door down. Cops come in. Guns drawn. Flip everything upside down. Start hearing helicopters everywhere. I still have PTSD whenever I hear a helicopter. Because oh, of all those raids as a little kid. But I remember having to be very calm under that kind of duress mm -hmm. because I didn't want my mom to get scared. So my mom, when she'd be laying down handcuffed, she'd be screaming my name to see if I was all right. So you took control. Yeah. And I, and I just, my mom, all right, mom. Like, just calm. Mm. And I think I developed that skill to be very calm under pressure. So that skill came at a young age. And then you just kept on. Polishing it. Polishing it, yeah. Polishing it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it kept on getting better. Yeah, it kept on getting better. And, and, you know, yeah, but I mean, definitely it's just in business and life, you know. I mean, if you think about it, like think about it this way, right? When I say life and pain are inseparable, right? Mm -hmm. It, I mean, think of, like I think of like when your mom gave you birth, right? She went through the most pain in her life to then a minute later have the most joy in her life, right? Again, if you're a follower of Christ, who, who better to give you the perfect example, right? He, Jesus went for the ultimate, through the ultimate pain so we could have the ultimate salvation, right? It's universal, right? The, the only way you can grow is if you go through resistance, right? And um, I've kind of narrowed it down to this as far as like, what makes you happy? And I think at the end of the day, what we're looking for is to be happy, right? Mm -hmm. It's not all the money in the world because you have all the money in the world, but you're not happy, right? But what makes us happy, I believe, at least for me, is I realized that you always need a purpose in life. Well, that purpose, if you think about it, just logically, again, common sense, a purpose is always going to come with a problem, right? That's the challenge. <laughs> you're right. Your job is to solve it. And then when you solve it, you have what I call restricted freedom. What the restricted freedom is, this is where you get to be present in your accomplishment, and this is where you get to celebrate, reward yourself, but it's restricted because eventually you have to find a new purpose. Because if you don't find a new purpose, then you have total freedom which is this fallacy that people say, you want total freedom. You don't want total freedom, because if you had total freedom, you wouldn't have purpose. And if you wouldn't have purpose, you wouldn't have problems. And then you'd be bored. Man. And then you'd be bored at the game of life, right? Like, just think about it, like in sports, right? If we were to play basketball one-on-one -on -one and I beat you or you beat me 15-0, like, it'll be fun for the first couple games, but are you gonna wanna play me after that? It's boring. You're like. I'm not being challenged. See, in life, you always want to be challenged. I mean, even in relationships, if you think back of, you know, ex-girlfriends or, mm -hmm. you know, why you ended up marrying your wife or, you know, it's probably because they challenged you. You weren't able just to step all over them, right? At some point, like, we want to get challenged. So purpose, problems, they, they, go, hand hand. they go hand in hand. It's like, it's like yin and yang, right? So and here's the thing. If you don't have purpose, and so you need to have all three at the same, right? Purpose, challenges, or barriers, whatever you want to call them, or restricted and restricted freedom, right? You want to have all three. But again, just think of this logically. Say you had no purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Then what happens is you'll go create your own problems. Every stupid decision I've ever made is because I had too much time in my hands. I was bored out of my ass. Oh, shit. And then I got trip. into some <laughs> stupid shit that got me in trouble. Right? So you have too but much it's, time. Yeah, I didn't you're have not purpose. Pre, your mind isn't preoccupied right. with producing. Yeah. Like I, 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 I won't sense. get into the details of <laughs> how I got, <laughs> I've made those stupid decisions, but I was having a shitload of success, and I'm like, eh, it's time to like relax a little. And too much time <laughs> to think. I got into some 
<laughs> made some too stupid much party. decisions. Yeah. yeah. Make stupid decisions. But it's because I had, I had no purpose, you know. But if you have the purpose, that purpose always comes with that problem or challenge, right? And then again, your job is just to solve it. And again, when you think about it, right, we were put on earth to create. And whenever we don't create and we stop mm -hmm. creating, right, then that's when we go stir crazy. That's when we start developing anxiety. I believe that's when you start getting depressed, right? And that's, that's why you see, I think, sometimes people that have all the money in the world, yet they're still miserable because they stopped growing. They, they don't have a purpose then anymore. It, that is know? so true. Now they're just sitting on their money without purpose. So eventually they become miserable. You know, they go find their own problems, start picking up the alcohol, they you start, start picking up the strippers. They start you start up generating all. your own yeah. freaking problems. You, you're creating mm -hmm. something that could have been prevented. Yeah. It's, just, it's like, imagine a shepherd dog, right? Like, if you don't give that dog a purpose, like I used to have an Australian purpose. I've been an Australian uh -huh. shepherd. Uh -huh. If I didn't take that guy running with me all the time, he'd destroy my backyard. You don't give those dog, a, you don't give those sh those guys a purpose. Oh my god! They'll destroy your stuff. It's no different than what we would do if we don't have a purpose. We'll just destroy everything. That's a great point, and I'm gonna yeah. probably watch this episode twice and start taking down some notes yeah. too. Now that part I, I, is in all areas of your life, right? Because you could have purpose in business, right? And and that and and and, and that's growing, but then you don't have purpose in your fitness. So that starts to die, right? So you literally start living like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. You're great at business, but you suck at your family. Or you're great at business, but you it's suck at your fitness. It's super lopsided. Yeah. So the idea is that in all areas of your life, faith, family, fitness, finance, you should have, you should apply that purpose, problems, and restricted freedom. Do all you right? believe in I balance? Mean, th think about fitness, right? Mm -hmm. Restricted freedom. I have my restricted freedom on Sunday. I eat whatever the hell I want, blah, blah, blah. But if so I you have, have your cheat day. But if I had my okay. total freedom and all I, <laughs> I love ice cream. Man, I could eat the ice cream and cheesecake all day. I could eat my, I could eat an entire pizza by myself. And, but if I did that every day, I got to have restricted, right? It's like, all right, I did it. Now it's back to, and again, I want to stay sharp there in my mm -hmm. fitness because that makes me better at, gives me more energy for work. Absolutely. It gives me better, I can handle stress more because my body's ready for it. So do you believe in having balance? So, great All question. across, of a, a personal, business, like how do you balance things out, quote unquote? I don't know if you believe in balance or not. Yeah, so great question. I don't, I don't believe in balance. I think, me neither. I think that if you want to be great at something, it's going to take most of your time. But I think okay. the, the, the good news with it is that during your lifetime, different areas of your life will spike. So the key is to identify what areas of your life aren't spiking and then just make incremental increases, improvements in those areas, right? It's not about perfection. It's about progression, right? So if you could just identify what area of your life is not spiking, then as long as you're making little improvements, you're growing, right? Because what you don't want to do is focus on an area of your life and then you don't improve the other areas because if you do, you let those areas die. So I'm sure we've all heard you're either growing or you're dying. Or you're dying. So the key is identify what areas of your life aren't spiking and just make little incremental improvements on those. Baby and steps. Baby you steps. don't want to start making some drastic changes because then burnout comes out. I mean, right. And then you burn out or yeah. you don't mm -hmm. fulfill that, I mean, what you had yeah. intended to, and then you fall back to the old patterns. Yeah. And, and then what will happen, too, is the reason I say during your lifetime, different areas will spike. So there'll be a come, I think that part is in Ecclesiastes, too, right, where, where in, in the Bible, I mean, every great information is in the Bible. I think, like, the most principle, the, the best principles of success, if people would just open up the Bible, they're right there. But there's a time for everything. There's going to be a time for you to go to work and bust your butt off. I mean, one of the reasons I worked my ass off at a very young age, even though I was making a ton of money at a very young age, I, the re, one of the reasons I didn't get comfortable was I knew that eventually I was going to have kids. And eventually I wanted to have 
the opportunity where if I didn't want to go to work, I didn't have to. Like, mm. I don't have to miss any b baseball, you know, basketball. Little league. Little nothing. league. Like, if my kid needs me there, I'm going to be there, right? Nice. And I knew that, so even though I didn't have kids at the time, I was like, this is my time to pay the price. So when they are 8, 9, 10, they'll remember that I was always there. That's beautiful. Because you created that. You made that. You made that possible. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So that was kind of, you know, and, and again, that was spike, right? And then your family is born, so then that may, might spike more, right? And then maybe your business, you're not as on it on as your business mm -hmm. as you probably were in your 20s or 30s, but you're just making sure that you make incremental improvements on that. You know, there, there's going to be a time in your fitness, right, that, you know, but you can't, again, if you want to be just jacked beyond jacked, like that's going to take most of your day. So then where's business going to come? <laughs> Can't be all buff and not have everything else. Right. On point. <laughs> so, you know, so that's the way I look at balance. What kind of mindset do you have to have to possess those skills or to be able to, to make those adjustments or to be able to say, you know what? I identify this is what's wrong. So these are the type of adjustments that I'm going to make. Like what mindset or what thought process do you have to have? I think your dream has to be bigger than any excuse you can make on why it can't. I think if your dream isn't big enough, then what's gonna happen is your, the excuses will eat you up. And if you're, again, your dream has, the way I look at it is your dream has to be big enough to mm -hmm. fight off your mind when it tells you it can't go on, right? To fight off when it tells you I can't do it anymore, right? Um, has to fight off your bo your body when it's like telling you I'm tired. Stop. I'm tired. Right? If your dream is big enough, your body and mind won't matter because at that point your spirit will take over and your spirit will hmm. get your mind and body to go on. Right? So but I think people just unfortunately don't dream big enough. If that dream isn't big enough, why would you want to go work your butt off? Like at some point you'll sell out. And again, the beautiful thing about your dreams is they change at different times. You know, my dream today isn't the same dream I was at 21 years old. Like now I work as hard as I work <coughs> so I can provide people the same opportunity that I had. You know, I look at myself like I'm just a byproduct of one person giving me a shot. You know, at, 50, you know, at the beginning I told you at 15 years old mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to get a job working at a call center. What I didn't tell you is that originally I got declined for that opportunity. And I didn't tell you that 16 job interviews prior to that I got rejected. Like 16 no one, times? Yeah, no one would hire me. I went to rallies. <laughs> I went to the Panda Express in, on Pacific. They wouldn't <laughs> hire me. Like, I literally, I went to UPS. They wouldn't hire me. And what would happen is I was so timid that during the interviews I get so nervous that I would start stuttering. And mm -hmm. then because I'd start stuttering, I'd get really hot. So then I'd start Sweating. sweating. And finally, a buddy of mine in high school says, hey, I found this job. They hired anyone. Like, just show up because he knew the situation that I was in. He says, just show up. I'm like, dude, are you sure? How are you sure that they're going to hire me? Dude, I've sent the last seven, eight people there. They've all gotten hired. They're going to hire you. Trust me. He's just like, show me, up. Just show up. <laughs> so I get up in my mom's beat up 1982 Sentra, which had no shocks. And I basically <laughs> bounced my ass all oh. the way to Santa Fe Springs. I went down to Firestone Boulevard. And I remember getting there, and I was already kind of hot because my mom's car didn't have air conditioning. I had the roll-up windows. So I had the roll-up windows down, so I was just sweating. <laughs> and I had a white shirt, and I'm like, all right, I'm a little hot. But in my mind, I was like, please don't start sweating. You know, it starts getting in your head. So two minutes into the interview, the guy's like handing me over a freaking paper a towel. Oh, man. <laughs> and the first thing I thought was like, damn. He noticed, because I was thinking, like, I hope he's not noticing I'm starting to sweat, because am I sweating or am I not? I feel kind of hot. And when he gave me that, I'm like, shit. He noticed. He noticed. <laughs> and then, then, boom. <coughs> oh, it just started raining. It looked like I just finished a marathon by the time of that interview. <laughs> and you were wearing a white shirt. And I was wearing a white shirt so you could see through it. So, of course, I don't get the job. Like, you must have thought I was on drugs, right? He was probably on. So, man. I go to the restroom, and I'm cleaning myself up. And I remember at that moment, I'd start praying. I said, God, just give me a shot. 
All I need is a shot, and I promise you I'll work very, very hard, and I'll always praise your name. But just give me an opportunity to help my family out. And as I walk out, gentleman outside says, hey, when do you start? I said, I don't start. You guys are completely full. He starts laughing. He's like, who told you that? I was like, oh, the guy I just interviewed with? He's like, come with me. And he walks me over to the HR room, and he says, I need this kid to start tomorrow at 3 p.m. The story gets crazier. That same person is the same person that six years later helps me start the security company. No way. And here we are 24 years later. Company's made over $500 million. Um, we're on pace to do it in the next two years, what's taken us 24 years. And one person gave me a shot. And that's why I'm a firm believer that in life, people just need a shot. People need a system. People need a, a leader that believes in them. That's going to be patient Absolutely. with them. That's going to show them how to do it. And that's my biggest driver today. Like the money doesn't drive me anymore. Like after a while. It's just the byproduct, right? Yeah. The, after a while, hard. like at first the money did drive me. Don't, I'm not going to get it wrong, right? But after a while, you, all right, you got it. What's next now? Like that kind of stuff. Like that's my why. And that's what keeps me freaking working. And because again, I love when Ed Milet says your dream's got to be big, so big that everybody's dream can fit inside of it. Oh man. And one of the cool. great things that I do now is I'm reliving my life through the people that work with me. You know, one of my guys just bought himself a $2.5 million house uh, last week. And it just it reminded me when I first bought my $2 million house and I was like, whoa, and now he's doing it, right? You know, so one of us. puts a smile on your face. Oh, hell yeah, yeah. Um, is just seeing them do, like, go through those steps, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I want to give people the same opportunity that I had. Like, I want them to make the kind of money I make, right? Like, as, as long as you're doing, mm -hmm. the way I've set up the company is I'm building entrepreneurs within the company. And, you know, in order to do that, though, we're big on leadership development. Right, because like I said earlier, you're only, you're never gonna out earn your self worth. You could have the platform where people can make six, seven, eight figures a year, mm -hmm. but if their mind can't accept it, they're never gonna get it. So, our job is to build their identities to make them believe they can do it. One of the greatest things you could do as leaders make people believe they can do something because if you do, they'll manifest it. And that's we're big on that because they got the talent. They got the platform. Now I just need their mind to accept that they can make that kind of money. Like one of my goals is I want to create the most six, seven, eight figure a year earners that the that our industry has ever created okay. in in our company, and we're doing it. It's 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 great. But that's a skill that you develop, like a leadership role, mm -hmm. like you being oh, yeah. a leader to these uh, to your your agents. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you? Um, scale that and become such a great leader like is did you do a lot of self-development like i did how did so, you get to that point so i think you're gonna love this story so a lot of my success my early success came from remember i told you i didn't like school yeah right well it's not that i didn't like it i just wasn't getting paid for it so <laughs> but that's a good one but the great thing that I'm i use that one from now on but the great thing about the call center where i worked is that they would make you, before we got on the phones, they would make us work for an hour a day on our mindset. And we used to do communication drills, we used to have tonality drills, we used to role play all the time. And literally for an hour a day, five days a week, training, right? And I did that for six years. And like a How old were you? From uh, 15 to 21 years old. So this is at the call center. They, that's, they did this. And everybody that was a manager there all became millionaires. And it was because of those trainings they gave us, right? Wow. But me being a dumbass, at 21 years old, I start my own company. Total freedom, right? Mm -hmm. So like a dumbass, I stopped studying. I'm like, I don't need that. I was only doing it because they were making me, right? Well, for the next 20-something years, I never picked up a book. Never picked Listen to a podcast. No books, no nothing. podcast, no type of self-development? Nothing, nothing. For how long? 20-some years. 20 oh, years. Oh, man. <laughs> and, and so this is where the story gets good, right? So 2016 comes around, so 17 years later, and I'm making more money than I've ever – the company's – I shouldn't say I'm making. The company's making more money than it ever has, right? Mm -hmm. So the gross revenue is going through the roof, right? And the self, it was the first time that I surpassed 
my self-worth. 2012, 2013, I started to make more money and the inner voice started talking to me. The inner voice was like, you're not smart enough. People are going to find out that you've just been getting lucky this entire time. You're hiring people that are way smarter than you and they're just going to find out that you've been lucky. And maybe you have been lucky this whole time. And that the more money I, we started to make, the company made, the more money I made, Mm -hmm. that voice got louder and louder. And I knew what the problem was. The problem was I hadn't studied on my mind and I knew it, I kept procrastinating. See, we all know what the problem is that's keeping us from growing. And I am, ah, I'll go next, I'll go next, like I'll go, I'll go next month and next month. And finally, it took one of my sales guys to drag me to a 10X conference from Grant Cardone, <laughs> right? Man. And he drags me there and I sit in it and I'm like, and I'm like, how old were you there? Well, this is 2016. So I want to say I'm 38, 39. And that was the first Grand Cardone conference oh, yeah. you've ever been. Yeah. Any conference. Any conference. I haven't done anything. Oh, wow. And okay. uh, so then I'm like, <coughs> okay, so Excuse I get me. out of there and I'm like, so the self limiting belief was that I, I wasn't very smart because the school system made me believe that I wasn't very smart because I graduated hmm. with that 1.8 GPA and I never passed tests. So I just kind of thought I was dumb. Like that was okay. my thought. I'm like, oh, I'm just not that smart. And, but I knew what the problem was. So once that conference was over, I picked up the book 10X. And at first I couldn't read it because I couldn't retain the info. Like I read it, but I keep reading the same page. I couldn't freaking retain it. So I got the audio, mm. couldn't retain that either. So finally I just started playing the audio, hitting stop and writing it down. It's the way I read the whole entire book, 75% of the book. Oh, wow. And okay. that's, that's how I was able to retain the information. But what's crazy about that is now I was like, wait a minute, everything that's in this book, I already did. I just didn't know how to articulate it. And my mind began to accept, well, maybe you are this smart because grants worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. and you're doing the same thing that he's done all your life. You just didn't know how to articulate it, right? And then my mind began to accept it, right? And what happens is whenever you can get your subconscious mind to accept to what you're saying consciously, you'll start attracting all the right people to make those dreams happen, right? So in 2015, I had gone in front of the whole company, we had a big holiday party, and I'm like, we're going to be this $100 million company, and I declared it, and that's how it should start, that you declare it, right? Problem is I didn't believe it, right? Mm -hmm. And, but now, and I remember I told you, you don't, you don't believe something in your heart until you experience it. So by reading that book and knowing that I had done the same things that Grant Cardone had done, like literally, I just didn't know how to articulate it. My heart started to believe, like, I am worth $100 million. I am pretty smart. I I've done everything smart. that's on that book before that book was written. Exactly. So what <laughs> happens? Amazing. So what happens in 2017 after that? My wife books the show Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, right? That opens up the floodgates to me to be, to, for me to show kind of the, the glamorous life I had. I was going to ask you that. Because I was never a guy that was like, hey, check out my houses, <laughs> check out my cars. Like I... <laughs> I just always got embarrassed. Like I've always liked nice things, but I promise you, like when I first had my first convertible at 21 years old, when we'd get out of the clubs, I'd have mm -hmm. my friend drive it because I was embarrassed of too much attention. But I just loved having it, right? No way. Yeah. And um, so I was never a guy that liked to show my stuff, right? Now the show come, came out and it did that for me. So now like all these sales guys were like, wait a minute, your business allowed you to get on that show? Like how the hell did you get on it? And then Grant calls me and that's how I was able to get on his podcast because I was able to go on his oh, podcast. Oh, because of the show? Yeah. So you think that show opened doors? Oh, for sure. Big time. They, they People started taking me more serious. Like all of a sudden, you know, being on TV makes you look bigger than what you are, right? Wow. So all of a sudden, Grant calls me, you know, it's what he called the $40 million Hollywood Hills guy yeah. or whatever he called it, right? <coughs> and um, in fact, one of my top guys this year DM me from me coming out on that Grant interview. And he was just like, hey, I, I, I just want to be around you. I hit rock bottom. You know, I'm living with my parents. Guess how much that guy's making five years later? A couple million. He's going to make six this year. 
Yep. Yeah. So you think there's a lot of power behind social media and exposure and those shows. Like It gives you just a One, different type of level of exposure. 100%. So, so again, so just... But back to that story, right? So what happened in 2017? So Real, Real Housewives, my wife mm-hmm. books it. Grant Cardone calls me. From there, Ed Milet calls me. From there, Jordan Belfort calls me. From there, you know, I'm able to go on these shows and I'm able to show that, hey, our business allows you to make that kind of money, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's, and we started hiring a higher caliber of, of rep, uh, of agent, if you will. Because the exposure was there, the exposure. so people were reaching out to you. Right. Like, hey, like, I seen you so, on so, TV. So the beauty of it is that now we were bringing in people that had the mindset. I just had to show them the platform, right? Wow. Whereas before I had to work on, the, I had the platform, but I still had to train them on the mindset. Like I still had to change their thinking. So I was hiring kind of like bottom of the barrel people, okay. right? Uh-huh. Which there's nothing wrong with, but I, I was the bottom of the barrel person right i'm the guy that couldn't complete sentences right and that mm-hmm. would sweat and all that <laughs> um and there's you know my top guy right now is one of those bottom of the barrel people right he's like me right he's the top guy in the whole company if you, if you were to look at him he'd be the last guy you would pick to be on your team to go no sell. way yeah because he kind of looks like a thug right like tats everywhere oh, got the neck tattoos oh he's got <laughs> big big pants big everything <laughs> he doesn't have the biggest team but he's he sells the most He's a hustler. He's a hustler. Okay. And drives a Ferrari, lib- he has a house on the beach in Hawaii. Like, he's done very well for himself. Oh, no But way. if you look at him, and he's been doing it as long as I have. So he's got longevity in the game, too. Which, um, But if you look at him, you're like, you're not picking that guy, right? Um, then I have my other guy that I just told you about that DM me from the mm-hmm. Grant Cardone show. And that dude looks like he's came out of an Abercrombie and Fitch mag, you know, <laughs> magazine, right? We got 18 year olds, we got 60 year olds, we, we got every everything you can think of. So I just love that, and it's what I love about what we do, it gives everyone a shot. You know, cause some industries, if you don't look a certain way, if you're not connected to the right people, if you don't come from the right college, they don't give you that shot. And, and I'm able to give everybody a shot no matter what. Like as long as you wow. have the desire to freaking want to do this, um, you can do it. But my point is, you know, whether it's bottom of the barrel or now we're just getting guys that like no, would have gone to do medical sales or mm-hmm. financial services or would have gone really like I'm getting those type of people. Right. They just need and, and it's just the growth is so much faster because they're already coming with the right. They're hungry. They got the mindset. They've already been studying. Um, and that's been the explosive growth that we've had. But it all it all happened, I had to take the first step. See, everything in life is reciprocal. If you want something, you have to give it first. So I always thought to myself, man, if I only had access to those guys that go do real estate or those, you know, those, mm-hmm. those freaking awesome ass salespeople, they would crush it in my business, right? But it took me taking the first step to become a better leader to attract those people. Does that make sense? And it took me going through that resistance of picking up a book for the first time. You know, uh, that was the first book, 10X, funny story, mm-hmm. that I had picked up since Charlotte's Web. <laughs> and I didn't even finish Charlotte's Web, and I read it in the ninth grade. Wow. Now, at the, at, uh, you know, if you, at the call center, we had those mindset trainings, mm-hmm. but I don't consider those books. They were actually like trainings, but an actual book book promise you the last book i freaking had read was charlotte's web and now Big old I, gap yep and now you know i've always I, then i made a, a cautious effort to study on my mind every day so just the way i work out every day i set aside 20 30 minutes to work on my mind so what does that consist of uh bible so mm-hmm. i I'll read a scripture right um keep it simple i don't i'm not there like just going through 10 pages okay. i'll read one <coughs> one chapter a day, and then from there, I'll read anywhere from three to five pages of a book. Right now, I'm reading a book called Uprising by by Erwin McManus, which I'm loving. It's all about character and not letting success crush you, right? Because, you know, you want to have this life that people aspire to be like you, Mm -hmm. but most of those those people are getting crushed by the life they're living. They're not loving the life they're they're living. So how does success crush you? Like in terms of because it change because what happens with success is 
success comes with a lot of options. Yes. And those options, that exterior starts to change you because you're now hanging out in places that, you know, you start to lose that humility, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the idea is that you live inside out. So you, if you live inside out, you transform the exterior versus the exterior transforming you. So the more, that's why you see, when you see a lot of successful people, they, they tend to F it up all the time. Whether it's their marriage doesn't work out. A diff, you know, something happens when they're just, they let that success crush them. And so what this book about is, is your character. If you mm -hmm. if you build your character, that success won't crush you. That is one of my biggest fears. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so aware of it. Mm -hmm. And, and I know, it, yeah. and I continue because, you know, I'm a man of faith, of yeah. course. So I always ask God, like, no matter how much success or no matter what you bring or what you put in my life, like, I want to just remain the same and be aware of where mm -hmm. things are getting a little bit too big. Just mm -hmm. just keep me keep you grounded. Humble. Keep yeah. me humble. Keep me. That's why I said this last week. I said, I don't ever want to believe my own hype. I keep my head down and I keep working. Yeah. Because I think. When you start, you're right. I'm not at your level, so I'm not comparing myself like, okay, oh, but, right. you know, so, but I do understand that when people are at your level, I think a lot of things start affecting their judgment, mm -hmm. start affecting their character, mm -hmm. and it ends up crushing their families and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I know I want to be very aware and very vigilant. Yeah. And I just ask God to keep me grounded. And just keep me, you know. Just it's, it's the greatest gift you can have. And I think that's when you believe in God, there's humility, right? Absolutely. If you don't believe in God, there's a little bit of arrogance there. And I think if you have humility, then you're always going to be about integrity. Because if you have humility, you're going to care about people first, right? And if you care about people first, you're going to have integrity. You're not going to screw people over. You're going to keep the promises you make to other people. You're going to keep the promises you make to yourself. And that's going to give you courage, to do things, right? To take on things that demand more than you think you're worth because you've had the humility to work, right? Not to think that the problem with arrogance is you get to a point you're so successful you don't want to put in the work anymore. Mm -hmm. See how that happens? All of a sudden, you don't work as hard as you used to. Why? Because now you got arrogant. Now you think you could just <clears throat> coast. And if you coast, you can get your butt kicked by somebody that's going to be continuing. That's hungry. That's hungry, right? So it's the humility to, to, to know, hey, I don't know everything. I got to continue to work. And the, the thing is, the more successful you become, the more you have to pay attention because one sentence can change your life. But what happens <laughs> is the more successful you become, you're like, oh, I know this. I know this. So you don't listen anymore. But then there could have been one sentence there that could have changed your life forever. So you almost have to be more attentive the more successful you become. And that's why I think humility grounded is, is is such a big big thing have you ever dealt with something like that when you start feeling like oh man i'm i mean i'm doing very well um and i've done it start i've done it twice you start and losing, i got my ass kicked you, yeah okay and it, but i don't think it was arrogance it was more <coughs> it was more like man you've been going hard for 15 years like this is your time that you should probably just you deserve a break deserve a break and both times i did that freaking almost Back lost fire? everything yeah oh man Okay. So now that I'm having the most success I've ever had in my life, I'm freaking stomping on the gas. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it ain't happening again. Yeah. How important is motivation mm -hmm. and how important is discipline? I think discipline is the, you know, motivation fades out. I think discipline, the higher the discipline, the happier you'll be. The mm -hmm. lesser the discipline, the less happy you'll be. Now, the thing you need to know, understand about discipline is that it's very, very hard. Discipline comes with a lot of resistance. But the beauty of discipline is if you can sustain it for a long time, it becomes a lifestyle. And mm -hmm. it's not hard anymore. It's just, it's just the way of it's life. It's regular. Right? It's an everyday thing. An everyday now. thing, right? But again, discipline always comes with resistance. Remember yeah. I told you pain? Yeah, absolutely. You to, I agree. The, the, the sooner you learn that life and pain are inseparable, the more successful you'll be. So discipline always comes with a little bit of pain. You Absolutely. gotta have pain, right? Yeah. So I think that's the, 
and that al allows you to sustain success. Whereas like motivation, you can be motivated for a couple of days. I mean, just look at all the people that go to all these <laughs> seminars that are like, they uh, become like fight club. They're just at every seminar rah, 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 and they don't do anything. They don't they apply go, anything. They fist pump and they pound their chest yep. and then they go home yep. and repeat exactly what they were doing. Yep, because they're not willing to go through the pain, right? So, yeah. you know, I think um, talent, I think uh, some, when you have uh, talent, I think you, you think sometimes, unfortunately, it gives you a little bit of arrogance, mm -hmm. right? And I think when you're disciplined, it just, you, you understand it's, it's about hard work. I agree. I pride myself in me being disciplined because yeah. I'm motivated, mm. but I don't sit here and lie to my agents and say, I wake up every day like, yeah, I'm super pumped. Oh, no. Discipline kicks in. The discipline kicks in. Yeah. Discipline will you get know, you like, going when, when you don't want to do I, things. I didn't right? want to go to the gym today. Right. And I was like, ah, oh, man. No. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm doing this. And shit, I had man. a great workout. Yeah. Now you feel great. And I feel amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. You know, so what, what's, if you look, so I said the higher the discipline, the happier you'll be, the lesser the discipline, the less happy you'll be, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the difference of discipline is what? Pleasure, mm -hmm. right? So the lesser the discipline, you technically have pleasure, right? The, the problem is when you have, if you sustain pleasure for too long, you're not very happy. Mm -hmm. It's another reason why pain isn't pain's a good thing like going through rough things is a good thing right because if you think about it if you sustain pleasure for a long time and you just continue to eat ice cream all day long bomb bombs mm -hmm. every day on your couch <laughs> a lot of pleasure you're gonna end up in trouble right if you end up having too much pleasure with anything you're not gonna be very happy think about that because everything in excess is kind of bad right exactly so yeah I agree. So the lesser the discipline, yeah, you might have more pleasure. Like there's no pain, but you're not going to be very happy. Yeah. The higher the discipline, yeah, you're going to have to go through a little pain, but the higher the discipline, the happier you'll be. Great point. All right. So I'm not going to eat that four by four in and out. You could eat it. Great pleasure. But now for the rest of the freaking day you feel like shit yeah. you're lethargic you're just slow oh. you're slow because you're, slow. You're, you're on carb overload you ate four patties you shouldn't ate the four patties man right <laughs> exactly so you know so that that that's like a good example of that mm -hmm. right so absolutely what is your number one distinguishing quality that you feel has propelled you or has has gotten you to where you're at now always had unwavering faith like just we're gonna figure this thing out like okay. somehow some way i mean here's a perfect example like i just started a solar company two years ago well actually like a year and a half ago and i should be the last guy starting a solar company because it's it's a, it's a construction company mm -hmm. yeah we call it solar company, but essentially it's a yeah. construction company i don't even know how to change a tire <laughs> <laughs> i promise you my car breaks down today <laughs> You and me both. Yeah, I do not know how to change a Dude, tire. It's not happening. Triple A is coming to change yeah. my tire. Well, I remember at 16 years old, I went on a date. The girls changed the tire. Oh, my God. I would um, probably do the same thing. But it's what happens when dad's not around, right? I, nobody taught me those yeah. things, right? But uh, <laughs> I um, I lost my point. What was I going to say with that? What was the question? Uh, what? You're... Oh, yeah. yeah. So I should be the last guy <laughs> that started a solar company because I... I I, um, I don't even know how to change a tire, right? Wow. But I was like, I don't know how we're gonna do this, but we're gonna figure it out. Like, we're gonna start a solar company. And you know why I had to start a solar company? Why? Because I lost 25% of my sales force to all the solar agents. So at, my, in, at the end of 2020, remember I told you I had two times where I got my yeah. ass kicked? Yeah. At the end of 2020, I got hit with the perfect storm. I got hit where my contract got dropped by 350 bucks a contract per per 
and we do twenty thousand a year back then. Damn, that's so a that's lot. About, yeah, that was <laughs> seven million profit. Boom, gone. From there, as I'm trying to negotiate this because I have no leverage, I have nowhere to go. Like the, they had all the leverage on me. I'm trying to negotiate as good of a contract as I can. I finalized the deal four months later, and mm -hmm. just just back and forth. I find out my number one team got recruited away by my biggest competitor. They got a big old sign on bonus and they all left. So that was 25% of my sales force. Just like that. Gone. <laughs> then as I'm looking, I lose another 25% to solar because everyone kept going after my alarm guys because there's like same amount of work, but 10X to pay. 10X like, to pay. You know, that was the pitch. And uh, all of them left. So so now before, and then I lost 15%. No wonder a lot of real estate agents are doing solar right now. Oh, yeah. And then, well, <laughs> it's not as easy as they think now. but uh, And then 15%, I lost to crypto. So, because mm. back then, everyone was making money in crypto. Like, everyone They're was just banking. trading experts. Oh, yeah. And they were making a shitload uh, of money. I don't know about now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know about, I don't now, know about right? now. And uh, so I lost 65% of my production and, and the worst thing that could happen to a company that's scaling is going <sighs> from 20,000 back down to 8,500. So at that point, you know, the only thing you could do as an owner or as when you're trying to build something is just the only thing you control is your attitude and the amount of action you put towards something. And I always go back when heart, when shit hits the fan, my work ethic, I just start taking massive action. Like just, just like you go back to the trenches and like just I just, yeah, I go cycle freaking 16, <laughs> 18 hour a day, six days a week, like no time for friends. Like I, I don't, I'm not a good friend. I'm not, you know, I'm just zoned. So when you were going through that, I'm alone. Oh uh, yeah. There and, is, and your wife and your, and your kids. Yep. Did you have a talk with the wife? Yep. Listen, yep. I'm I'm yeah. all in right now. I'm all in. You gotta leave me alone. You know, Sunday, let's do something. But Monday through Saturday, I, I'm not gonna freaking fail this shit, right? Now, I could have done something which was, I could have easily laid off half my staff and I would have been profitable <laughs> again because we get residual. Mm -hmm. But if I would have done that, the only guy making money again would have been me. And that doesn't drive and there's me. no fun in that. There's no fun in that. Like in order for people to make the kind of money I want them to make, I have to build it big enough that they can make that kind of money. Right. Absolutely. So I was like, we're not going to lay off anybody. I have <coughs> faith back to faith. I have faith that we're going to build this thing back to what it was. And we're going to build a solar company while we're at it. For the next 10 months, I probably worked the hardest I've ever worked in my life. Mm. Hands down, not getting the result. Right, and it's coming close, not getting the result, not getting the result. And honestly, what kept me going was this inner voice I had kept telling me, it's supposed to be tough. You think it's supposed to be easy? Like you think you're gonna be a billion dollar company and you think it's gonna be a cakewalk? You it's thought- It's gonna be a walk in the park? Yeah, because that's no. what I signed up for. I'm like, all right, we're gonna, let's, let's you know, we're gonna be a hundred million dollar company 2015 now. I'm like, we're gonna be a billion dollar company, right? Like this is what mm -hmm. we're gonna do. And I remember as I was going through the pain, it's like, it's supposed to be this hard. You're supposed to go through this. And that's what kept me going. And I just kept freaking hitting it, hitting it, hitting it. And sure enough, October of 2021 hits. And by then we had gotten a little success. So we mm -hmm. went from 8,500, we were on pace of doing 12,000. Everything just hit. That number one sales team that left came back. Mm, so things started And then all in place these again. people that I was working on for 10 months all hit at the same time. And then the thing just took off like a rocket ship, you know, and then 2022, we had 30,000 installs. So we went from 12 to 30. Mm. And then this year we're on our way to 60 installs, 60,000 installs. 60,000? Yeah. So that's, you tripled. Yeah, that's tripled. Yeah, well, almost six X. Yeah. And, but it took me going through that pain. See, and what happens is a lot of people give up too soon. It, anytime you start taking actions, positive actions, it usually takes six months to a year to see a result. But what happens is people take positive actions for two months, three months, four months, and when they don't get the result they want, they, they stop, right? While I was just kind of focusing on the, on the, on the process, 
this is this, this is what I'm supposed to go through. And it, and it, I know for a fact, just because I had done it before, mm-hmm. when you put that kind of action towards something, there's always going to be a return. It's a universal law. But if you do nothing, you get nothing. And I just knew there's no way in hell that I put all this work and I'm not going to get a return from it. It's going to happen. It has to happen. And I'm just going to keep planning. Bam, bam. And now, granted, I knew that I was taking the right actions, right? Because you could be taking the wrong actions. But I just knew, Mm -hmm. man, the way I just, I'm going about this, like I know it's going to happen. And then it happened. And, you know, now we're just, now people see the success that we're having, but they didn't see that dark moment that I had to go through. People always just see the end result. Yeah. And don't see the struggles, the trials and tribulations. Oh, yeah. They, and then you appreciate it way yeah. more because yeah. you know what you've been through. You know what you've done. Yeah. And that's why uh, it's important to share that. And they're going to hear it today. Yeah, you got to be you able know? to, I call it, you got to be able to live the dream. I mean, sell the dream, even though you're living the nightmare. And Shit, that's bars right there. <laughs> oh, and, man, that's... Um, in fact, you know, if you go on my Instagram, uh, I'll, I'll send it to you. In 20, at the beginning of 2021, all, I'm going through all of it, right? Because it's mm-hmm. at the end of 2020 this happens. So January, I have to go sell the dream to everybody after everybody left. Oh, so remember, we lost 60. Every, everybody's shit. like, hey, is Skyline going out of business? Like, is it finally their time that they're going to go out? Because, again, we've been doing this now for 24 years, right? And it just, our, our VP, who um, uh, uh, who Angel knows, okay. right? I actually met Angel through our VP. He decides he's going to get into land development. Oh, no, he got recruited to solar as well. Oh, man. So even he had left, and he was kind of the <laughs> face of the company, right? So everyone's like, dude, what's going on with Skyline? They lost everybody, right? And I started, what's great about this video when you watch it, I get in front of the whole company, and I have to get behind something. So I literally just start saying, and at first, I maybe believed it, <laughs> but I just needed, I needed something important to sell. 30% in. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, we're going to do in the next three to five years what's taken us 23 years to do. And while we do it, we're going to create the most six, seven. I didn't say eight figure back then. Now I'm saying eight figure because it's happening. Six, seven <laughs> figures, uh, six and seven figure a year earners that this industry has ever produced. And I just kept saying it and saying it and saying it. Like to the point where I'm sure my guys were like rolling their eyes up. All right, dude, I get it. We're going to be the most six, seven, eight. And then shit, here we are two years later and the shit's happening. Uh, I bet you they're like, oh, shit. He was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he, he but, was right uh, on point. <laughs> I'll send you that. It's actually pretty cool. Right. I, just, I just found that video the other day and I posted it. And I was like, holy shit. I remember when I said it. And it was during a dark moment. I didn't, but you you do mm-hmm. see the certain like I was like we're gonna figure this shit out. We're gonna will this thing to Man, happen. You manifested it and you made it happen. Yeah, we're gonna will it to happen. You were probably like just tunnel vision. Oh yeah, nobody talked to me. I don't want. I don't even want to eat. Just yeah, working, working, working. Yeah. So now that you guys are at an all time high. Yeah. You know you're a high net worth individual. Mm-hmm. So my question to you is. You make a substantial amount of money from Skyline. Right. Where do people like yourself invest that money? Real estate, stocks, like where? Well, I've always been into long-term growth. Like, Mm -hmm. because the cash flow is coming in, like, I need something more for, again, the future. So I love an IUL, an index universal life. I got two of those. Yeah, I love those things, man. Especially no, you just solidify. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, okay. especially if you're yeah. about long term growth, right? Absolutely. Like, uh, like compounding of stuff, and okay, because you know what I like about an IUL is like, let's say, God forbid, you do some stupid shit with your money, or somebody freaking takes you. Mm-hmm. Ain't no one taking that, right? It's, it's there. It's there. You know, and and because God forbid, when you're mm. older, you don't have as much energy as you do when you're young. So. Do you have several IULs? Yes. Do and you, and I go ahead. And do you have IULs for your kids as well, or is it just for you? Or so bad mistake I made. My wife, I kept telling her, "Let's get your IUL. Let's get your IUL." She kept procrastinating. Kept procrastinated. She got diagnosed with cancer. She's already beat it. She's mel- she's got oh, melanoma. Okay. She had Thank eleven God. melanomas, but now they won't they won't let her get it. 
Oh, because yeah, of it. Because of it. But yeah. she beat it. But she beat it. Yeah. Thank God. Thank yeah. She's got okay. a billboard on Times Square right now. She's. Uh, oh no way. They made her the spokesperson for the melanoma melanoma foundation. It's called no Get way. Naked. Yeah. You know, so. I watched your guys' interview last night too. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> cool. Teddy, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's. She seemed really nice. So she's. Uh, in fact, we were just at that foundation dinner where they were honoring her for you know for her being the spokesperson. No okay. But um, so I love an IUL. I love real estate. I mean, I've I've uh, I've accumulated. I, I wish I would have done a little more real estate, but my yeah. my business is so operational intensive that normally I have to, especially solar. Like solar is like, you talk about operational mm -hmm. intensive. That thing is operational intensive. But um, I love real estate. Um, I just think real estate again, long term, you okay. can't lose on it. Do like, you do you invest in a certain product like multifamily, so you know commercial, funny, or I want to. The homes I have now are just the homes that I've upgraded. Mm. So the the I never had to sell any of my houses. Well, I actually sold. I wish I didn't sell it, but I sold one of my houses. But um, actually, two of my houses. You know, one of the houses, smoke pop smoke got killed in no uh-huh he airbnb no it. no way yeah. so that's the house i had to sell because it became everybody from new york would come and try to like take pictures take pictures and, you know hop through the back and, and so you just sold it instead i just sold that i want to deal with it my, my house where i was living at the time uh was five houses away from that so oh, i bought shit. you know i told you my, my 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 dream was so specific that i wanted to be on the edge of the hill overlooking the whole city so the house that Pop Smoke got, I was going to say got smoked on, mm -hmm. um, that was my original house that I bought in 2011 that overlooked the city. But it So had, you lived in that house? Oh, yeah. But it overlooked it overlooked the city, but it had two houses in front of me. And so my, the view was yeah. obstructed? It wasn't. Okay. Well, you still saw the whole city. But it wasn't but what I you didn't, I didn't like the houses in front of me. Okay. So I kept looking at this house that was... The third, the second house in front of me, that one was on the edge of the hill, and I'm like, "That's the house I want." And I kept looking at it for five years. Um, came up for 2014, I couldn't buy it because I went up against Megan Allison, you know, hmm. third daughter of the third richest dude in the world. <laughs> I with her. And then I finally was able to buy it in 2018, so I started renting that house out. And then, unfortunately, that's that's that that tragic thing happened. But that's wow. why I was a, I sold that house. But other than that, like I've never had to sell my houses, so I just rent them. Okay. And uh, again, what I love about that is that a you can depreciate them. B they're they're bringing your amount down. The price principle keeps going down. up. It's like and like principle I wanna, goes down, appreciation goes up. So I kind of look at it kind of like an IUL too. It's like long term. Like nothing's going to beat that. Absolutely, um, I agree. And uh, you know now I want to. Uh, I want to get into something that's non-operational, isn't? Because both of my job, my, both of my businesses are very operational intensive. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to get into some like um, land developing, but not where I have to do the work. I just, you know, just hire somebody. Uh huh. So like Angel and yeah. and, and I'm, I'm gonna do some work with Freddie, who's my VP of sales. He got into that. He's oh, okay. Pretty good. So I'm just like, here's some money, you know, and you know, you, you need people you trust with that. So okay. I never been much of a stock guy, but. You know, I did it. Not good right now. Yeah, I never been. I should have never been much of a stock guy. No, I went Real against. Estate I do love. I went against my rule, which is stick to what you know. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, hey, let me put in this amount here, and you know, diversify. Yeah, yeah, I probably won't do it again. I yeah. think when I hopefully soon I get back what I've lost. And I'm taking it out and just putting yeah. it back in real estate. Did you lose money in crypto? Uh, not much, but like, yeah. Well, I lost money in crypto. Man, you know what I, I went with the hype, man. I sort of. I, you, you know how I got sold on that shit? Crypto.com. Oh. When that thing came out, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna have to. If crypto. If they if Staples Center just changed to Crypto.com, I guess the shit's real. You you want to hear something funny? Yeah. I have the majority of the money in, on that. When that happened, I'm like. Something I mean, shit. Yeah. They changed Staple Center to That's it, what right? I said. So I'm like, all right. And I had a buddy of mine like, yeah, do this and yeah. do that, and here I go, fucking. I lost yeah. three hundred grand on that bullshit. But I didn't. I lost and twenty, I, and I should have known. 
like you said, like if you don't know how something works, but I was just I like, had zero clue. Yeah, and near that. I lost, and the stock market, I'm down like eighty. Yeah, I that that doesn't settle well with Same me. Like, I don't like losing. Money I don't like, like losing, and <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, yeah, I put in a substantial amount of money in there, but. Yeah. Why? Why did I do that? Yeah. I should have gotten an IUL. I, I should have gotten something different. And then now, every time I log on, it's like it hurts my feelings. Like I don't like losing. You I worked got really hard. hard. Those things went up in price. That's what I'm saying. I could have <laughs> took that money and I put it freaking so, right or some watches. Yeah, yeah. Man. So, all right, man. This is um, this interview for me is it's very important because I feel like uh, um. Some of this information is super valuable for me, so I don't take it for granted. That's oh, why, thank you. you know, yeah. I, I, I would, you know, I like to, you know, for me, it's very important to see how high net worth individuals process things and how they invest their money and the things that they do because mm. you are successful not by coincidence. Mm. This was premeditated. Yeah. Everything that you've done from what I've, from the last hour and a half that we've been here, it's like you manifested everything. Yeah. And it's super, for, for me, it's like a treat. Like, I'm like, yeah. oh, man, I'm here like a little kid just listening. Like, okay, and I'm probably going to watch this twice, take down yeah. some notes, and I hope our audience gets a lot of golden nuggets because yeah. it's very important. You know, it's a cool book um, that, you know, for many for many years people would say, because, you know, I never, I, I, I didn't pick up books. Mm -hmm. They used to be like, have you read that book, Think and Grow Rich? And I was like, no. It's like your story reminds me a lot of Think and Grow Rich, right? And I finally read it in 2020. And I was like, shit, this is an actual science, <laughs> right? Because like, <laughs> like that book is him interviewing people mm -hmm. back in, what was it, the early 1900s? The, and they were saying basically the same thing that I just kind of said today in just different ways, right? Different and, eras. Yeah, different smart. eras. But uh, as I looked same at concept. it, I'm like, Oh shoot! Like this is an actual science because they were applying it. I I just happen to kind of I, I always, you know, another gift of mine I think that I've been very blessed with is just uh, wisdom. Mm. You know, a lot of that stuff came from just common sense, but you know, for some people, it's not that common, right? Yeah, but common think, sense ain't that common, especially I in think, our industry. You know, <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 it's not. It's not that complicated. We we complicate it. But if you really sit down and, and think about it, and it's not that complicated. I think that's a great book to, to get your... It's a hard read. Mm -hmm. Like, it took me a while to read it because it's, like, old English and stuff. But I think, like, if you were going to have your kid read something, read that's that? a book you have them read. How about Rich That Poor Dad? 10X. I, I, I yeah. read 10X as well. Yeah, I love that book. Uh, 10X is, is amazing. Like, that's one of my favorite books. Um so you were with Grant Cardone, mm -hmm. and this is just a, a, a thought, you know. Like, what do two, I mean, of course, you were part of his podcast, right? Mm -hmm. So after the podcast, what do two high net worth individuals talk about? Well, funny story about that podcast is that, remember, that's the first podcast I'd ever come out on, right? Mm -hmm. Never done a podcast before. And I'm now doing, like, one of the biggest guys' podcasts, right? And... Remember, I was worried about me not being smart enough because this mm. is barely when I started my okay. journey. So the funny part is, um, again, Freddie, who's Angel's friend that I got mm -hmm. hooked up with, Angel, kept telling me, hey, Grant wants you to come on on his interview, I mean, on his on his podcast. I was so mm -hmm. scared. I kept saying, nah, I'm busy. I'm busy. I, I wasn't busy. I was just, I mean, I was busy, but I You're was a little scared. scared. I was scared. Because I saw Grant once tear a guy apart because the guy didn't know what he was talking about. Mm-hmm. And I just started getting all those doubts. Like, oh, shit, what if I start, you know, what if I start stumbling my words? Did what if start I start sweating? sweating? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's what I was going to ask. Did you start sweating? Oh, that's what I was thinking, man. Yeah. I was like, man, imagine I go on there and I start sweating like I used to do in the interviews. Oh. Like, fuck, no one's ever going to want to work just with make me. make sure you didn't wear white. I'm not, exactly, I did not wear white. <laughs> Actually, I brought I bought some just in case. But anyway, I was like, no one's going to want to work with me. Like, so that's why I didn't want to do it. So, but I prepared so much for that interview that there wasn't anything you couldn't have asked me that I didn't know what I was going to say. Good. Preparation. Like I, I prepared so well that I, even if I wanted to fuck it up, I wouldn't have fucked it up. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <clears throat> so, I, I, you know, other than faith, I get a lot of confidence from preparation. 
if I know I'm well prepared, mm -hmm. my confidence is, is, is high. So, but that said, I slept one hour all that damn night because you were nervous. I was nervous. And then again, I just, again, blessing to God. I just, when it was is show he, time, it was just, I was on. Is he always high energy, even off camera? Yeah. No, he was cool. He was very cool. Very cool. Um, you know, he's, he's fast. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. And he's, he's done a great job of just freaking building his empire. Do you see some similarities between you and him? Definitely a lot of uh, same thought process, pro uh, processes. Like okay. that's why I think I like 10X okay. quite a bit. Um, you know, funny, funny story about 10X is that, so the, the courses that we used to take at the, at the um, call center, mm -hmm. the owners were Scientologists. Mm. And they used to make t they, they they used to take make us take these courses <coughs> that had nothing to do with religion, right? Because Scientology had this um, they called it Wise College, okay, and that was the business part of Scientology, right? And that's those courses we took. So, as you know, Grant's a Scientologist, mm -hmm. so. The book 10X, a lot of that is from it's, all those it's courses. It's related back to. That's why when I told you that when I finally read it, I was like, wait a minute, I've done all of this shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like these were things that I was already I could have wrote this book. Yeah, like, I was like, I took massive action. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know all that. I actually that, went 20X. <laughs> yeah, you know, success is your duty, like, you know, all that stuff. I was like, wait, you know. So um, so in, in that way, um, I, I think... Uh, but I'm probably a little more similar to Ed Milet. Okay. Yeah. How was that experience? I, oh, he's, I, I he's, watched one that of, he's one of my best friends. He's, he's, I uh, watched that home. He's my mentor too. Like, oh, I've, no way. Yeah. So that's why I said he's, he's, you know, I gravitated more to, to Ed. He's more my style. That's why I started studying him. And, uh, you know, one of the great things about like when Ed and I hang, like I don't ask him any business questions. Like I've studied him so much that I already know all the answers. From so it's just the average conversation. Yeah. You guys have you, similar you interests. Know, when, you, when you think about it, it's like the last thing he wants to do if we're hanging out is freaking have Talk another business. dude asking him another question oh, about man, business. Oh, man, I could just imagine. You know what I mean? Okay. But I don't, like, I'm not going to waste his time. Like, yeah. every answer I could ever have, just study the guy, and he'll give you every answer, right? So, you know, that's what, you know, the thing about mentorship is, you don't, they t nowadays, before it wasn't like this, but nowadays anybody could be your mentor. Yeah. Just start studying them. You know, I have notes and notes and notes and notes and notes of Ed Milet, word for word. And I started studying that guy like crazy. And then, you know, now, like I said, he's, he's a mentor. He's kind of a, he's a best friend of mine. Uh, Erwin McManus, same thing. That's my other mentor. Mm. Uh, if you know who he is, study him quite a bit. He's a pastor of Mosaic, John Gordon. He's become a very good friend of mine as well, who's a, a lot of mentorship from him as well. Just, you know. What's one similarity between all of your mentors? Faith. We're all big so believers. All big in faith. We're all big believers. We're all about serving people first and uh, humility. I think, I think, you know, I, I, I love that about, you know, like all very successful, but I, I just like how, how um, but followers of Christ. You know, I think, I think, um, you are who you associate with. And remember how I told you there's different areas of your life mm -hmm. that will begin to spike at different moments. Like for me, one of the things that I'm trying to get closer to is, is God. Okay. So if you want to get closer to God, right? I want to hang out with people that are close to God. Absolutely. Right. When I was partying like crazy, those, yeah, were, was... those were my friends, right? I used yeah. to hang out with the guys that wanted to party. You know, now, and they're still my friends, but I don't really hang out with them because we don't really have nothing in common as far as that anymore, right? So you just keep them, like, at a healthy distance? Yeah. Like, like, okay, well, cool, hang out. Yeah, no, like, I'd love to, you know, but, like, Six minutes, okay. yeah, but I'm not going to get, you know, like, I don't get toasted every freaking weekend anymore, you know? Do you think that affects um, your productivity? Oh, yeah, like alcohol? Sure. especially as you get older. Like I can't. Hangovers oh, are horrible. Horrible. <laughs> yeah, horrible. Like four or five days at last, man. So I got to be, you know, actually, I, I loved a, a Grant post I saw the other day about him declining some pretty cool parties. 
and and it, it resonated because I've declined some pretty cool parties, but it's just it's not worth it. Like, man, my day is too important the next day to yeah, I think fudge I that up. I decline every invitation, every realtor invitation. Yeah, because I feel that it's nothing productive going to happen. Yeah, I don't want to wake up feeling like shit. Yeah, and I don't want to mess up my routine. Yep, because I will pay. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm really hard on myself. I see you could have avoided that. You could have just went home and yeah. just. Yeah. Sorry, and I think you have kids too, right? Yes. Yeah. So it's. Like, I'd rather be with my kids. Exactly, because that's the other thing. If you get plastered, like you don't even have the energy for your kids the next I day. Can't do that. So it's not. It's not even about you anymore. Because like, if it was, if you didn't have kids, yeah, you could just lay around all day. But and imagine, you, like, if you're always working, and then, like, that's why Friday, Saturdays is hard for me to go out because I'm like, that's usually when I spend time with the yes. kids. Is all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and the last thing I want to be is hungover. Yeah. While I'm hanging out with them, that's why I need to bring the energy to them. That's why my wife Monday through Friday she pretty much like go ahead. alone. Yeah, same yeah. here. Go ahead. And I get if I get home late, she's like, "You were home late." Yeah. But come Friday, yeah. I, I don't work the weekend, so yeah. I'm just there mm-hmm. with my kids. I'm just happier doing. We could be watching TV, and it just makes me yeah. You know yeah. So one last question. You guys have something, um, a new product that involves the uh, real estate market? Yes. Which is, uh, what's a squatter program is what we're calling it, okay. right? Where, you know, when when investors, you know, buy a home, what's been happening quite a bit is you have a squatter that if he enters your home and he's there for, I believe, a week or so and you can't catch him, then he now has rights to that house. He, establish, he establishes a tenancy by putting a light bill or anything like that. Yeah, so he's now there and... and you got to evict him. So it's a real it's thing. A so, you know, what we're doing is working with real estate agents where we give them the alarm system uh, when they buy their home. We give them their alarm system and now they can remotely manage everything in that house mm-hmm. as it's time to actually sell it. So if somebody breaks in through the door, breaks from to the window, obviously they get a notification that somebody's breaking in and then the police are now dispatched, right? Awesome. Um, so it's a way to help them out, but also when the new homeowner comes in and buys it, you know, the idea is that we have first dibs on it and if the customer ends up getting it, the uh, realtor gets a healthy commission on it. Mm, okay. And then on top of that, there's also the solar side of it, so. Awesome. Mm-hmm. All right. So, so we're working so with a lot of real estate agents. Uh, they love that stuff. And um, and then, again, just e- even if it's not a squatter program, it's just a real estate agent, obviously. You know, the thing with homeowners, they're going to get an alarm somewhere, right? Yeah, right. And if we can get to them first before it becomes public information, then it's a slam dunk, right? But, but the beauty about the real estate agent is we give everything everything away at no cost. So we can give them the installation equipment, at no cost, the only thing they pay for is the monthly monitoring, mm. right? Okay. So you you almost gift it to them because what will happen is if you don't do it, they're going to get hit up by God knows how many mailers, how many calls. It's going to be ADT. Typically, they're going to say, "Hey, we're going to we're going to give it we're we're going to give you this at no cost. It's two doors, one motion." And then when the installer shows up, they're going to upsell them all kinds of money, and before oh, you know it, they're man, coming out of it with four thousand bucks. 5,000 bucks when they could have just got everything at no cost. Hmm. So that's, we're actually going to cover the doors, windows, all that good stuff from the get go. Cool. Yeah. No hidden. They show up later trying to. No hidden fees guys. Yeah. Bam. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for stopping by. I know you're busy. This was a lot of fun. That flew by. Yeah. It was almost two hours. Oh shoot. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Damn. Okay. That's why. We did a Joe Rogan style. Yes, and honestly, it it means a lot to me. And I know that yeah. this one, I was just more paying attention. <laughs> it's like, man, so I'm going to go back and probably cool. watch it twice and, t- and take down some notes because you're not successful by accident. I think I appreciate it. You know, everything takes a lot of effort, a lot of sacrifice, and I hope that our audience gets a lot of golden nuggets because mm. uh, there's fundamentals to it. Mm. And I think there's... It's, it's, there's a lot of behind the scenes that they don't know. 
Mm. Then they, they probably got a little glimpse of it now, and yeah, and maybe they could implement this in their lives. Yeah. So this is pretty cool that we're able to do it for an hour and forty four. It's got me to tell stories that I never man, told I think before. we could have gone for more. Oh yeah, <laughs> I was just warming up. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you so yeah, much for, for stopping me. by, and we might do a part two. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Awesome, right. Edwin. Thank All you right, so champ. Much. Good to see you.